What I want to do uh, this evening is to do two things, really. Uh, first of all, to um, make the case, the rationale for the work that we're doing on innovative learning environments and why we think it's a very important and relevant strand of international work. And then secondly, to outline some of the key conclusions uh, and frameworks that have emerged and that have already emerged, drawing particularly on the nature of learning, the, the volume that uh, Ishmael uh, has mentioned. Uh, first, though, I just want, by way of introduction, um, I do want to say a couple of words about the OECD and education since, as Ishmael said just now, there's a tendency to assume that we only started at OECD to become interested in education with the first PISA surveys. And this is not actually uh, true. In fact, from the very um, first year of work for, since the OECD was founded in 1961, there was the beginning of quite intensive work on education. I've put up there the fields, really, that defined that early work, educational planning, equity, uh, the early nascent science of economics of education, and science itself. There was a great concern at the time uh, that um, in the wake of the Sputnik crisis, uh, that the uh, OECD member countries, their science education was falling behind, particularly in the context of the Cold War. So those define some of the very early uh, preoccupations, which changed quite swiftly as the 1960s went on, and our center was founded in 1968. Again, not coincidence uh, that in Paris in 1968, when there was so much turmoil, that there was also a readiness to think about the long term, think about different futures. And this really sums up our, our mission, really, uh, which is to look ahead. It is to use um, international findings and examples and it is to try and identify and stimulate innovation. So that gives you a sense of what we've been trying to do over the past 44 uh, years uh, in our center. Uh, and the work that I'm uh, outlining to you fits very centrally in that mission. As Ishmael mentioned, I've been working uh, on a big project on the future, Schooling for Tomorrow, <clears throat> and more latterly this, this particular um, uh, program on innovative learning environments, which has come out of uh, the Schooling for Tomorrow uh, work. So first of all, the rationale. Why learning, why innovation, why learning environments? First of all, why learning? I think it's perhaps something of a banality, or it sounds something of a banality now to say that we live in a, a knowledge society, a knowledge economy, but although we hear it a great deal, it doesn't make it any less true. And to the extent that knowledge is central, then so is learning, necessarily. If knowledge is central, so is learning. But then, of course, that raises immediately the question, what kind of learning? What kind of learning are we interested in? And I'll give um, a partial answer to that uh, in, a, in a moment. Coming back to, to PISA and similar preoccupations, there's been a very strong focus on measuring learning outcomes. And of course, that's related to my first question, what kind of learning? But understanding, measuring, surveying outcomes doesn't tell you how to change them. Doesn't, once you've mapped patterns of achievement, you've understood some of the correlating background factors, it doesn't actually tell you how you can change those outcomes. And for that, we say we need quite a strong focus on the nature of learning environments themselves. A third factor, I've just mentioned three. I've come from France, so there's a kind of Cartesian thinking in threes. Um, a, a third factor it comes from a very strong pressure across all kinds of settings, countries, provinces, states, cities, to reform education. We're under a lot of pressure to reform. Uh, in many systems, there's a kind of reform fatigue because there's been so many reforms and changes. And a sense of frustration, I think, in some quarters that this doesn't bear more fruit, that there's been lots of change, lots of reforms, 
but somehow a sense that too much stays the same. And to my mind, that suggests the need to look afresh at the very heart of education, that is learning itself, how we organize it, how we teach to it, and so on. So those, I think, introduce in terms of learning why we at OECD are so interested in. Why innovation? Why, why put together learning and innovation? Well, one reason is that on these conventional measures, on these now well-known familiar measures, there are a great many of our young people who are not succeeding very well. And across the, the OECD as a whole, that's right across the, all the OECD countries, the 34 of them, um, that's about a fifth of 15-year-olds are not reaching the level two in reading, which is one of those international benchmarks that is often proposed to be a, a sort of a, um, a minimum international standard of the competence that we need to function in today's society. So there's a sense in which the innovation comes from actually looking at some fairly conventional indicators and saying, well, if, if the existing models, if the existing arrangements are not performing well enough, we need to be ready to innovate. We need to be ready and open to do things differently from how we do them. But I don't think we're just looking to improve within our established systems. I think increasingly there's a growing ambition for what learning should do. So we come back to that question I posed right at the beginning, but what kind of learning? And I think increasingly we're looking at at least two or three um, aspects that are, that the, the need for innovation comes from the fact that we're getting more ambitious in general. We're in the 21st century, we realize these are complex, advanced um, societies and economies that we live in. Therefore, the learning that we're talking about is correspondingly complex and advanced. And I think we're talking now about learning going well beyond some kind of rather um, conventional understanding of a grasping factual material, if ever that was an adequate definition, looking now much more towards deep learning, the grasp of concepts, the grasp of material that can be used in different contexts, not just the context in which it's learned. Those famous competencies that are now often described as 21st century competencies, um, nothing peculiar to the 21st century in those. Uh, the, well, the, by that it means, we, we usually mean problem solving, we mean innovation, creativity, uh, the capacity to work together in teams, entrepreneurship and openness and curiosity, those things that we call 21st century competencies, and particularly laying the foundation for lifelong learning. If we're living in knowledge society, learning society, then we need to become lifelong learners. And in the early years, we are in, in a crucial way laying the foundation for that. So it's not just that we're not doing the conventional things as well as we could, it's that we're expecting more and more. And that sets a real agenda for innovation. And as I say, thinking in threes, a third reason comes from the kinds of principles about the nature of learning that I'll be outlining in a minute. The evidence-based principles uh, are sufficiently demanding uh, that they call for a significant drive to innovate. So learning is central, and that is shared across many, many countries and, and settings. The drive to innovate is central. And then the question, why are we talking about learning environments? So learning, innovation, why learning environments? That's, I think, the first reason. We understand increasingly the extent to which learning is something that is cumulated, it's something that's in, in a crucial way um, contextualized. It's something done in context. And from the learner perspective, this means that we must think of learning in a holistic way. And we feel that the notion of a learning environment helps us to get out of the rather fragmented ways we often think in terms of education and to try and capture and understand 
in a holistic way uh, the learning experience as a whole. I think we need to think in terms of learning environments for the, for the rather familiar but no less important fact that the advances in technology and the ubiquity of now inexpensive, very powerful technology invites the rethinking of the possibilities uh, of learning and teaching. Uh, although in general there's a, a sense that this is, there's still quite a long way to go for that potential to really be fully uh, integrated into our learning environments. Nevertheless, I think there's a widespread perception that that has changed quite significantly the challenge that we have. And thirdly, we talk about learning environments because however important schools are, and I'm a great believer in schools, I think they're crucial and very important institutions, it's clear that we're talking often about learning that is not always taking place within schools. We're talking about non-formal learning, informal learning, hybrid learning environments. We just uh, finished a paper at OECD on the notion of hybrid learning environments. In other words, if we're too stuck in the institutions of school where we're, we're not thinking sufficiently uh, in a sufficiently open way uh, to capture the complexity of the ways in which we are now learning uh, in society. So that's pushing us, we feel, towards talking about learning environments and less talking about um, schools themselves. There's a further reason. Let me put this, this up. This, is, this looks a very simplistic framework and of course in some respects it is. System at the top, people say well what, what are you talking about? Are you talking about the system level, the school? Yes, system at the top, school, class, teacher, learner. It's a very common framework. It's a common framework not just in everyday discussion about education but in research, in quite sophisticated research. This very simple framework is often what is defining the agenda and the frameworks of our, our questions. We think that that is actually a rather misleading framework for some of the reasons I've outlined, but which I can um, uh, encapsulate in this way. So why look beyond that rather straightforward, unidimensional, vertical framework uh, when, our, when our focus is on learning? First of all, it's expressed very much in terms of institutional structures, systems, schools, classrooms, and it's not about how learning itself is organized. It's the starting point of buildings, institutions, facilities, and organizations. And we think that we need to turn it round. Those, of course, are very important, but we need to start thinking more in terms of how learning itself is organized and then how that works in different institutional and organizational settings. So, a first reason why we think that rather simple framework is not so helpful when it comes to thinking about learning is it's not sufficiently focused on learning itself. A second reason uh, is that it assumes essentially that the institutional arrangements that we have now are the best ones for the future. We start with schools, classes. We think that's where we're going to be um, the, the, the relevant framework to think in terms of organizing learning, and it discourages consideration of innovation. So essentially, it's not sufficiently about innovation itself. It's not enabling us to think sufficiently about what alternatives might be that, of course, might fit into schooling and school systems. And perhaps even more important than either of those two reasons when we're talking about the system, the school, the teacher, the classroom, these are very individualistic concepts. And they throw us back into thinking about things in terms of, say, the teacher, in terms of things like individual skill sets, individual competencies, rather than what teachers collectively can achieve together, collaboratively. And that was what I was saying earlier on, why I think, one of the reasons why I think the notion of a learning environment and thinking more collectively, more holistically, is, is very important. So those, if you like, sum up, not sufficiently learning focused, not sufficiently about innovation, and not holistic enough uh, are reasons why we feel we need to think 
somewhat beyond the, the, that rather simple framework and start thinking about organize, organizing learning itself. So that takes me to the second part and main part perhaps of what I want to say uh, this evening. And it's about our innovative learning environment uh, project and about the principles uh, that we've, about, of learning that we've derived in the first part of that work. I'm not gonna say too much about the project itself, but just to say that it really is about trying to internationally um, inform practice uh, leadership and reform. I put all those in there because we are interested both in terms of providing analyses, materials and exchanges that will be helpful to people who are working in the field, those who are school leaders, teachers, uh, experts uh, who are in the field, students and parents as well, if they're interested, we're, we'd be, we're delighted, but also in terms of those who are working in the area of policy and who are trying to uh, change things uh, through policy change. So we're wanting to address um, uh, all the key players in our work, and we're doing it through work on learning research first. Secondly, um, looking at innovative cases. We've gathered um, quite a number of those. And uh, thirdly, to move uh, into the area of how do we grow and sustain innovative learning? I put, I put that up, not because it, uh, the way in which we organize a project is terribly interesting, perhaps, but I think the, 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 the approach that we've come to of, of wanting to combine research on learning research with inspiring examples that might help us to show the way and to then locate that and embed that in understanding different strategies and initiatives for moving beyond the individual isolated case to much more systemic change. That's the, I think that's a, a framework that we think is quite powerful. And we've uh, uh, so far uh, got published results on the first of those, which I will tell you most about on learning research. Uh, we're in the process of writing up our second, uh, trying to digest the around 125 cases you see at the bottom there, the case studies, uh, and the many countries, states, and organizations that are participating with us. And that's been quite an important part of this work. We've sought to engage a large number of countries, states, and, and organizations so that it's not based on a very small uh, uh, club of those who want to take part. We're very keen that this extends uh, beyond a small number of countries. So that's the approach that we've taken. And that first publication is put up there. I, I, I'm so proud of the cover that I can't help but include it in a, a presentation. Uh, OECD books are not known for their visual appeal. Uh, and often they're rather uh, boring presentation. For once, we've managed in our seri uh, to come up with a, a, a cover that I think captures something of the freshness. Uh, and what we uh, sought to do was to get some of the leading experts in the world. And I say that really quite advisedly. We managed to get some really um, top researchers and thinkers from Europe and uh, North America to contribute to that kind of a framework that you see there. So for example, on um, emotions, Monique uh, Bocarts um, uh, contributed a, a chapter. Formative assessment, Dylan William from, from London. Technology and learning, Rick, uh, Rick Mayer from California. Uh, Bob Slavin, um, Linda Darling-Hammond, um, um, uh, Jim Spillane and Lauren Resnick. In other words, we, we managed to get some real authorities to help us to uh, do two things, to digest important and large bodies of research into an accessible um, scale, and to think about what that means for the design of learning environments. So that was what we asked each of them to do. And then in the final chapter, the future directions, we um, th wanted to get away from the, fragment, fra the, 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 fra the fragmentation of so much of this work to pull together the transversal strands that cut right across these different analyses. 
And that's what we um, did in that final chapter, and which I'll present to you now. So, putting together all that different research, part, some of it rather theoretical, some of it very much applied about working in groups, technology, working in the community, and learning in the family, and so on. We think these, there are seven um, principles that should underpin powerful learning environments. And we think that all of them are important. The first one is about making learning central. Uh, again, it's something that perhaps one would think doesn't need to be said, but, but it does need to be said. Making learning very much the central business of our education organizations, which is very much about encouraging engagement, the engagement of learners, and of uh, finding a whole set of strategies so that learners come to understand themselves as learners. So that learning and a very explicit and conscious um, exercise of, 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 the, of the business of learning becomes absolutely central. There's, I think, quite a common image. This is the second one about the importance of the social nature of learning. There's quite a common image of learning that it somehow goes on inside people's heads, that it's a rather private and rather hidden exercise. It's clear from the research the extent to which learning is something very social. It depends on interaction, it depends on negotiation, depends on construction with your environment, and often the very mo the most effective forms of learning are collaborative, learning together. Uh, not necessarily all the time. There's very much a position and a, a, and a role for self-study and autonomous learning, uh, but that it is really important to recognize the extent to which learning is something social and often collaborative. The key role of emotions in learning, I think, is something to underpin. And by emotions, we mean things like the satisfaction and the, the enjoyment on the positive side, that um, learning can bring, or the anxiety or the feeling of being lost, or, uh, or um, the, the, the negative emotions that can come when things aren't working well. Now, it's the, I'm not talking now about how to be nice to students. That's not at all what this is about. Although, of course, it's better if we are nice to students. It's uh, better than not than being nasty to them. But we're not talking about being nice to students. We're talking about the fact that effective learning really does require people to engage in learning, not to be anxious, to be motivated, and that that is as important. It's the flip side of cognitive development. But in our discourse and in our debates in education, it often takes a very much a, a secondary position compared with the cognitive development, the standards, and so on. It's, it's, it's a flip side. It's the other side of the same coin. And this is, I think, something very important to um, understand. The next two I put together, because they're in, a, in, in some sense, they, they do go together. And I think they're some of the most challenging aspects of that research on learning. The extent to which learning environments need to be acutely sensitive to individual differences. Uh, and one of the most important differences across groups of learners, is what they bring with them to their learning, their prior knowledge, their prior experiences, their values, their, their baggage, if you like. Um, so the sensitivity to those differences is critical. And that, that, that fifth principle that, I, that we, 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 we couple it with about being demanding for each learning, uh, learner uh, goes with that. Um, the, the need for learning environments to avoid, on the one hand, that there are um, uh, 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 learners who are coasting, who are not being challenged on the one side, and that there are learners who are lost on the other. And once you've lost learners, they will not engage, they will not be learning. So, the, but the research also shows that excessive overload, excessive pressure, it does not work. 
So how to be demanding, how to be challenging, but at the same time, how to avoid regimes of grind and of excessive pressure, thinking if we just push them harder, that's going to that's gonna do. We'll just, we'll just ram a bit more in. That's not the, the way to go. Assessment. Assessment is an absolutely critical part of any learning environment, any part of any education system. Um, it's a really important to know what's happening, who's learning what, who's not learning. But clearly, the key role of assessment is when it is consistent, the assessment regimes are consistent with what you're trying to do. So in terms of um, those, that kind of deep learning that I was talking about before, of 21st century competencies, foundations for lifelong learning, the question is, do we have as assessment regimes that are really helping us to capture that? Do we have um, assessment regimes that really are helping us in a very formative way understand uh, the, the nature of engagement, the, um, the extent to which uh, learners are, um, differences are being um, recognized and so on. So assessment critical, uh, but it has to be assessment that genuinely captures what we're trying to do with a strong emphasis on formative feedback. Feedback, absolutely uh, critical. And then the final one is about making connections. Called, in the book, we call them horizontal, connected, horizontal connectedness. And that's about making connections between any episode of learning and the bigger concepts that we're trying to uh, develop. We're trying to um, develop an understanding uh, of in, in learning episodes that build into something bigger. Are we doing that or are we... Um, um, uh, um, teaching particular episodes in a rather fragmented and rather isolated way? Are we sufficiently making connections uh, across different subjects, across the disciplines? Um, are we working sufficiently with projects that really bring together cross-disciplinary learning uh, that correspond to real-world and auth authentic situations rather than the somewhat artificial uh, situations that we have in our different um, subjects and disciplines? And are we making a sufficient uh, degree of connection between the learning that goes on inside and outside of school? So where a great deal of the learning is now taking place. So that's, those are our set of uh, seven uh, principles. And as I say, we think it adds up to a rather demanding agenda uh, because we're not talking about picking and choosing among those, but actually trying to do all of them at once. Re-expressing those principles in rather more familiar uh, language, I think, gives us these kinds of conclusions. Um, I think one can characterize those principles in terms of them being learner-centered, but to emphasize immediately that something being learner-centered, a school, a class, uh, a program being learner-centered, is in no way in contradistinction contra to um, the key role of teachers and teacher professionalism. In fact, without highly professional teachers, I can't see how you can have very strong learner-centered learning environments. And that second point, the importance of structure and design is part of that. When we're talking about um, inquiry-based learning, talking about group learning, it's actually very demanding of the professional repertoires uh, that teachers need by themselves or with colleagues or with others um, to make work. So, in fact, we're talking about uh, careful design and high levels of uh, professionalism. What those principles define, it seemed to me, to add up to, some, to learning environments that will be profoundly personalized. If we're talking about sensitivity to indi individual difference and strong regimes of formative feedback, that is um, uh, an engagement by learners, that's uh, personalization uh, very much so. Inclusive, the, 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 the very need to be sensitive to group differences, uh, 
to make sure that some are not lost, some are not uh, already outside and not learning, is precisely that we need to be inclusive, we need everybody to be engaged and to be learning, and social, um, that learning is effective in groups uh, and that there's the establishment of learning communities within schools and in the broader community around schools. So th those re-express those principles in rather more straightforward terms that we understand um, in education. Now I want to finish, I think I've got another five or ten minutes still. Uh, ten minutes. Um, I want to, I've talked a lot about learning environments, so I want to say a little bit more about what we understand those to be and the frameworks in which we uh, feel that they should be cast. I've talked about learners being central, and I think that is um, um, crucial. But learners understood in terms of the learning that goes on in the interaction between um, the teachers, and those are, I put inverted commas because some of those teachers will not necessarily be the qualified teachers in a system, some will be um, the artist, the, the, the parent, the, the expert, the, um, the, the other student. Uh, in some of the learning environments, there's a lot, peer learning is something and peer teaching is something very important. So the, the importance of the interaction between, uh, and in terms of resources, we're talking about the, the resources of space, the learning spaces, and the resources uh, of t uh, technology in different ways, the digital resources, the educational materials. In terms of content, of course, the kind of knowledge, the kind of skills, and, and we can see in uh, a number of the learning environments that we're addressing very deliberate attempts to introduce 21st century competence into their uh, content, sustainability questions, values, citizenship, and so on, as being very important part uh, of the content. So the interaction between those in terms of the mixes of activities and pedagogies. Complex and dynamic learning environments seem to us to need a very strong understanding of learning leadership. We're talking about making learning change happen. We're talking about design and redesign. And therefore, the concept of learning leadership, and that's something that we're working with the Foundation on uh, right now to try and clarify uh, what that means in this kind of context, what that means and what some of the important ingredients are and practices are is, is critical. So I think the notion of learning leadership in distinction to more general managerial understandings of leadership is a very important one set in this kind of context. That leads to particular types of learning, which we can evaluate, we can measure in um, a, a number of ways that we need to be very aware of. We need, we need an information-rich um, learning set of learning environments that are very cognizant of the, what is actually happening in terms uh, of learning. And very importantly, there needs to be the feedback of that information, of course, to teachers, of course, to students, but particularly back to, if you like, that learning leadership so that that critical information about what's happening can create not just formative assessment in the classroom, but that a learning organization is itself formative, formative in terms of understanding itself, understanding um, the learning that's taking place. Powerful learning environments will be applying in that, in that circle, and particularly in that that interaction between the learners, teachers, resources, and content through different pedagogy and activities, those seven principles uh, that uh, I put up before. The innovation comes in terms of being ready to rethink those core components and those processes, and the, um, the need to, to 
constantly generate and use information formatively can inform active learning leadership. So that circular set of processes and that framework for us is a, is a, a more convincing way when we're talking about learning of thinking about um, the, the uh, certainly at the micro level, and we're very interested at the moment, I'll come to, the, to other levels in the final uh, um, slide, seems to us to be more convincing than thinking in terms of the school, the teacher, the, the classroom, the teacher, the learner. Of course, that's important, but we need to have something more learner-focused if we're going to really address the organization and configurations of learning. So that's the uh, framework that we're, we're um, um, working with. That defines, if you like, our learning environments. We think it's very important that we, at that micro level, we, we look for different strategies, routines, organizational ways of trying to make sure that the institutional environments in which learning take pla takes place and that kind of le learning environment that I put up are as far as possible working together. And we know that in educational research there's a lot of discussion about the grammars of schooling and that's been a, a, a term used to describe how often s schools can function in ways that, that pull back those high ambitions and go back to routines that are familiar um, uh, because there's vested interests in not changing. There are whole varieties of ways, including through learning leadership, but in terms of um, whether they're learning walks, whether they're lesson study, learning study in Japan or Hong Kong, that are ways of trying to bridge between institutions and the way we organize learning to try and make sure that there's synergy at the micro level not that we've got organizations pulling uh, at cross purposes with what we're trying to do in learning. Of course, we can talk about sort of an, an atomic level, really, what's happening in individual classes uh, and learning episodes. But our feeling is that it's very helpful to see that in terms of the environment rather than to focus at very much at the that atomic level. Of course, you need to do that. You need to understand pedagogy. You need to understand the very micro level, the atomic level, as one might call it. But in terms of, of a, a wider systemic framework, we think it's very helpful to see that, that very, very micro activity in terms of learning environments and institutional environments in which they're embedded. This is the perhaps the level that I think is most neglected, what we call the meso level, which is very much about networks and, uh, uh, and environments, networks between environments and communities of uh, practice. And we're convinced that that level, that meso level, that networking level, is the really critical one when it comes to making change happen on a wider scale. All of this is not in any way to neglect the key role um, of policy and of those who are charged with actually making reform and change happen. But I think it somewhat recasts some of that role into thinking about how can we provide leadership in terms of what we're trying to do, how can we create the conditions, the incentives, uh, and the capacity to really um, develop learning environments that are dynamic around those seven principles uh, in the way that I described. And in particular, how can we encourage uh, the meso-level connections? How can we encourage uh, that schools work together, that educators work together? It seems to me that you will never get scale unless that is encouraged. It's always going to be at the individual um, micro level that change will happen and that will necessarily limit the extent to which you can um, really make um, a significant difference. So to sum up, I'm almost there. Um, I think we need to be ready to rethink learning and be ready to innovate. We need to accept, I think, those challenging agendas. I think we need to draw on research and practice in order to create and sustain 
uh, learning environments that put learning first. We need to look at ways to ensure that what some people call the technical core, the learning that goes on, is not at odds with the organization in which it takes place. We need to think about how to go to scale by developing that meso level, and that's what we're very much focused on in the third strand of our, of our project, and perhaps I'll come back in a couple of years and tell you some of those uh, examples of how people are really trying to grow uh, innovation uh, through networking and communities of practice. And we need system level leadership that will create favorable conditions and capacity for that micro and meso level change. It's not surprising, I think, that education systems in some respects change rather slowly. And often using evidences and um, uh, metaphors of how change happen that perhaps are inadequate for the, the, the way that change actually happens. I'm, I'm seeing all the time a lot of reference in the policy uh, world to levers, for example. We can see that, we can hear it in the international discourse all the time. How to, it's the imagery is how do you push at the, the levers, how do you get the coefficients right so that you're just fine tuning in an engineering fashion a human system. It seems to me that that's quite an inappropriate metaphor. We're talking much more organically. Um, but again, that's not being soft or, or um, philosophical. I think that's actually what the nature of learning systems are. Um, but that's very difficult to translate simply into policy terms. And a lot of it is about collaboration. A lot of it is about um, uh, building capacity. A lot of it is about creating climates and allowing things to happen. Um, and that doesn't sit very comfortably with uh, an, an understanding that educational change is, is more stick than carrot, if I can put it that way. Uh, it's more about enforcing rules. It's more about trying to cut down the risks by defining situations so tightly that we, nothing wrong is going to happen. And I think we know that education is far more complex than that. But that's not, so I don't think it's, but I don't think it's very easy. I, do, I, I, you know, I wouldn't underestimate the difficulty. We know that education is a very high profile area. It's become more high profile, and I think that's fair to say that's across all the countries that we work with in the OECD, um, that in political terms, um, education has moved quietly up the, the, up the agenda. And now it really is a top issue in most of our countries. And even when we know that there's a lot of very difficult decisions to be made about, about um, expenditure and so on, often education is, is recognized as being absolutely critical in a way that some of the other public services, for example, um, struggle more to do. So we know that it's a very high profile um, area and that it's, it's a very controversial area. I think some of the advice would be found in some of the things that Mario said immediately afterwards uh, in terms of um, exploring collaboration, uh, in terms of um, looking for ways of um, developing knowledge management. We, in education, I think we are not terribly good at managing knowledge. Um, a lot of, we talked about this yesterday, a lot of reinventing of the wheel goes on when actually if we could be more sophisticated about sharing experience, sharing research findings and so on, I think that what that would lead to a more dynamic um, system level learning organization um, that is often difficult because of the fragmentation. So we do have, I think, quite a, a difficult um, institution and organizational set of arrangements that will not easily trans transform and transfer. Why I think that this, the directions we're talking about will, in the end, win the day, he says optimistically, is because I actually think they will lead to better learning. 
and I, that's the title of the of the presentation: innovating learning environment, creating learning environments to improve learning. And I think that the more that education has become a, gl a global business, and of course with all the controversy around that that there is, one thing it does allow is I think for there to be an understanding of when something's working somewhere else and is actually leading to change and to, and to better learning. I think there's a, more of an appetite than before of saying, instead of saying, oh, well, that's that's Finland, or oh no, no, that's we couldn't possibly do that. That's 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 not uh, you know that doesn't apply to us. I think that's less and less convincing. So I think uh, the the reason why I think the changes will eventually quietly seep into the discourse is because I think they're a more appropriate way of thinking about education for the 21st century, and I think they lead they will lead to more effective learning, more engaged learners, uh, higher levels, more deeper understanding, and so on. So using research, thinking about innovation, and thinking about going to scale are all the things that people in policy are really interested in. Um, there are some issues that, of course, are quite difficult to, to, to deal with. Formative assessment, for example, can often be seen as something rather soft and nice as compared with summative assessment, something that's much uh, more summary, something that's much more comparative. Uh, but it strikes me that the, the, the importance of formative assessment, rendering learning more visible, to use John Hattie's phrase in his book, Visible Learning, how, to, how can we render learning more visible and more um, open to change? Um, that is the that's the challenge as far as I can see, but I think it will happen. I think you're right to, to identify right, to identify that are we talking about a consistent paradigm here if we're putting together PISA on the one hand and what I've been presenting this evening on the other. In one sense, I think um, they are very consistent but in, in the interpretation, they mightn't be. Uh, where they are, it seems to me, consistent is there's a real effort by the, those who create the instruments to try and capture some of the things that we are really concerned about. Um, there is a real uh, attempt to try and capture um, interpretation, to try and capture the way in which People can transfer, young people can transfer um, knowledge to unfamiliar problems. Um, it, it's limited so far in terms of how far it can capture things like more transversal problem solving, although that's certainly on the agenda and that the, the, the PISA team would very much like to make important strides in that. Um, so there's a sense in which... Um, there's not a, a straightforward contradiction between noting, for example, that a, um, a country seems to do rather well or a system or a particular region in a country does rather well on PISA and being concerned about deep learning, 21st century skills and laying the foundation for lifelong learning. I think the problem comes not so much in that part of the measurement and comparison enterprise but when the interpretation of that um, leads to um, ideas about what should be done, that in many ways you don't need the PISA results to come up with those ideas, particularly if we think that we're going to find those ideas in the traditional tried and tested methods of the 1950s and 60s. Um, so if PISA is used by people to say, ah, we need to go back to the good old days, then clearly that isn't uh, what I would see as being um, a, 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 a proper and helpful reading of the findings. Um, where I think there is a problem is when, and it often does happen in assessment in education, when people are more, are more concerned about doing well on the assessment measure than about improving education and learning. Then you've 
There's a problem when people are more concerned about moving a few steps up on the PISA table, the league table, than actually genuinely improving the learning that goes on. It's like how to, how to trick the international testers uh, by somehow doing well this time. If that's the motivation, then, then there's a, that's a fairly perverse motivation, although being a fairly realistic person, I know that that sort of thing does underpin some of the um, effect that it has. Is it possible for assessment to stimulate change? I think it is. And that's why I'm very positive about some of these aspects of, of, of surveys like the PISA surveys. As I said at the beginning, I don't think they tell you very much about how to change things. They give you a reason to make change happen. Um, but th what I think is the, the key finding of the PISA studies, since they were first published in 2000, is the fact that if you look at the the four quadrants in terms of high achievement and high equity, then the systems that belong in the, um, the happy quadrant that combine high equity and high achievement are those that many of, our, of us would like to emulate, the Koreas, the Finlands, and so on. In other words, there's a group of systems that seem to have managed to have um, both have to get very good results on the kinds of things that PISA measures and have reduced the impact of social background on those results. In other words, it doesn't matter so much who your parents are, you're, you're, going to, you're, 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 you're less likely to have to depend on who your parents are in, in order to get good results. So high equity, high quality. And that, I think, is a real is really quite an important argument. Um, it certainly goes against a conventional wisdom that says more means worse. You can't have, you, there's always going to be a drop in standards if you try and achieve more equity. I think the PISA surveys have done a very helpful job in showing that when you compare sy systems around the world, that is not true. Can assessments make change happen? Yes, I think they can, they can create the argument for change, whether the arguments that people make, whether the interpretations that people make of those findings are ones that we'd agree with, that's a whole other question. And we know there's a lot of quite, um, quite diverse interpretations made of the same, of the same findings. Um, I think the whole question, coming to the question at the front about different, um, creating different models of learning peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer learning from, from, from different models. I think those are all in the mix. Yes, I think that is. But I still think that um, I'm a great believer in the social nature of learning for young people at schools up to a certain age. Um, so I think that I'm, I'm very comfortable with thinking that we do need to lay foundations for social life and for learning of sharing a schooling experience. I'm not one of those futurists that wants to do away with school, a de-schooler. Um, at the same time, if you have managed to do that, then it strikes me that um, the, A, you've created an appetite for learning that allows some of the kinds of models that you've just uh, mentioned to, to become realistic. Unless you've got people who are engaged who are motivated, who understand themselves as learners, then it's a pretty tall order to then expect them to go out and create their own learning environments. So you need the tools, you need the motivation, you need the, the, um, the, the base of learning. So I think, um, but I'm also then feeling that once you've, if you can manage to lay a very strong foundation through a school system, then I'm very comfortable with a very, diverse set of pathways and experiences that then come next. Um, so I'm not a believer in keeping people all in the same formal institutions for as long as possible. Uh, I think we need to be realistic. Also from a financial point of view, I think the old idea that you, know, you stay longer and longer in very expensive education systems, I think we need to think about very high quality base, 
and then a whole variety seen in a lifelong learning way uh, of possibilities that can be fitted to individual needs to change the flexibility and so on. How do you create collaborative learning environments if you haven't got, for example, teachers ready to work that way? It comes back to the point that Mario was making, that you can actually recast those, those um, principles very much in terms of what the, the nature of teaching is about. And I think that's a very helpful thing to do, actually. Um, well, I think the, the, that's what this work is really all about, is, is creating collaborative, dynamic learning environments in which people do work together, uh, where you do break down some of those silos, where we do get away from a pretty old-fashioned understanding that, that you know, to use the opposite of John Hattie's phrase, visible learning, that what we're doing is invisible learning, that it's, we close the door, we... We, the, the last thing we want is anybody to see what we're doing because we're teachers. And there are, of course, that's a strong understanding of teacher professionalism that exists, that any interference, any, any encroachment on that personal space um, is seen as a diminution of professionalism. In my view, that's exactly wrong. That's the, far from being an encroachment on professionalism, that professionalism grows the more that we're developing collaborative professional learning communities where people do work together. Can we do it? I think we can. And I think the, I think the attractiveness of teaching will go up the more that we do it. So the question of saying, oh, but you can't get, you know, we can never get the right people going into, they're always going somewhere else. I, I think that the more that we move in this direction, the more that as in a country like Finland, where we know that you know, the top graduates want to go, well, the, the top graduates, but among the very um, uh, high-performing university graduates are aiming, many of them are aiming to go into schools as teachers. Uh, and that's partly about creating education systems and learning environments that are actually stimulating supportive uh, places for people to go and work in. Because uh, we're not... You know, I think we're not angels. I think we want to work in environments that are stimulating. We feel safe, but we also feel we're growing. Um, and so the focus on, on the learner, I think, does translate very importantly into the nature of the learning environment more generally and including uh, the nature of, of um, who we are as teachers and the nature of the profession. I think, you know, that's a, that, that is... A real challenge. At the same time, I think there's a, a tendency to want to see reading as some, some, something somehow basic, and then other learning and other knowledge is somehow more advanced. That we're thinking, we, we often in our in our in our very language, we talk about the basics, for example, and reading is a basic. Well, as it isn't really. I mean, reading is a fundamental vehicle. For, for advanced learning, and how we can um, embed it and improve it um, through the kind of work that we do may need sometimes some very direct teaching. I know that some of the examples of the schools that, um, that uh, are in our particular collection, it's only a small 125 schools out of the, from the world, it's a very tiny drop, um, some of them have put a lot of emphasis on non-fictional writing and have said that th there's a great weakness in writing, but they're still at the same time um, every morning uh, having the students do the radio program for the school as well. So you can have at the same time a very strong focus on how to really get youngsters actually much better at non-fictional writing, reading, at the same time doing some innovative things. So I think the, you know, that we, we need to be rather careful about the sort of basics versus advanced, advanced learning. On the question of partnership um, and how we bring families and communities and so on in, I think that's many of the examples that we've gathered um, are trying to do just that. And I guess we come back to the question of the rather weak knowledge management 
in education? How can we highlight, how can we bring to the fore examples where that's being done uh, more effectively? I think it's going to be very difficult to have sort of some general recipes for how do you integrate more successfully families into, into education, but there's a, certainly a great deal of work on that. The chapter that's in the nature of learning on learning in families, I think is very impressive. It's very US oriented, but nevertheless, I think the work by Barbara Schneider and her colleagues, I think gives some quite important pointers already to how that might be done. Um, but I think learning from practice is very important and that is really, a, 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 so not so much reinventing the wheel, it's, a, it's also being inspired by what others are doing. Uh, and we know that there are lots of uh, examples. Um, the, the question about architecture and, and buildings and facilities, I think the learning space is very important. We actually have a program in the OECD devoted precisely to that. Um, it is actually quite difficult, though. It's one of those areas, we certainly see it when I put up the, the learners, the teachers, the content, the resources, and how they interconnect. In terms of resources, I think the the use of space and the imaginative and learner effective use of space is very important. But at the same time, we know that it really does depend on how it interacts with everything else. It's how that space is being used by teachers, it's how it's being, group work is organized, how formative assessment is being organized, how techn technology is being used. So it's one of those factors, but it's always in interaction with everything else. Um, but I think it is uh, something that's very worth looking at, and certainly we need to get away from the box and corridor design of schools that's, um, you know, very uh, simple and helps to maintain this very fragmented, closed-door uh, organization of education that I think is, is such a bane on our lives. My talk, no, didn't really range over the inequalities um, uh, in society, but I think that um, some of the different approaches that we're looking at are very much trying to address um, the social inequalities and have been inspired precisely by that. Um, rather than thinking that innovation happens when you've solved every other problem and then you can start to innovate because you're in that comfortable space uh, where you've kind of, you're in a nice middle class leafy suburb and everything's going smoothly, so it's time to create a, an innovative learning environment. We know that it's often exactly the opposite. It's often in very difficult circumstances where you need to do something urgently to address really serious uh, issues. Um, how that all scales up, that's the kind of challenge that we're, we're facing. And because it's organic, there will never be a simple formulaic answer to that. Uh, but that's what we're aiming to do in this project. We're trying to learn from some of those experiences in different systems, in different countries, and create an international network, a community of practice, um, of which uh, you are part. So the, it's a high ambition, but I'm, I'm very fired up by it.